Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Welcome to Historic Mount Zion uh, Bible Discovery Hour on the first Sunday in the month of September. It's good to see you all this morning uh, as we begin our Sunday school lesson. Uh, the title is called When Love is Lost. Our opening prayer will be by Brother uh, Burton. Are we ready? Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Come now, Holy Spirit. Be with historic Mount Zion Sunday School as we come before your holy thrones of grace, of mercy, and of love, just to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for waking us up. Thank you, Lord, for just clothing us and keeping us enough in our right mind to call on you, to pray to you, to worship you, to give you all the glory and the honor to give you all the highest praise, because, my Lord, you are worthy to be praised. Glory, glory, glory to God on high. Hallelujah. Hosanna, Hosanna in the heights. Yeah. And now, Lord, as we go into our Sunday school lesson, let all hearts and all minds be on one accord so that we learn the instruction from you from heaven. In her holy son, Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. 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 And amen. 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 Let, the church, let the church say amen. 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 Today's, today's lesson will be taught by Dr. Lamar Pryor. Good morning, Sunday school. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are in a new text and we are using a new textbook. So what I thought I'd do this morning is to display that because I'm not sure everybody have a copy, but I know our Sunday school superintendent did a great job in passing out these texts. And again, I'd like to encourage you to read ahead, but today we're going to follow the text uh, because we are using a new quarterly and a different quarterly amen, amen. when love amen. is lost is the title of our lessons today and the scripture lesson is taken genesis and the focus scripture genesis 37 verses 2 through 11 and i'm going to ask a volunteer to read the NRSV version. You have both versions there, side by side. Can I get a volunteer to read that? This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zephyr. His father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report to them, to, to, to them, to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that, oh, but yeah. when his brothers saw, I lost my place, uh, which is not because he moved the screen. Four. Verse four. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once Joseph had a dream, and when he had told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, "Listen to this dream that I dream. They were there. Th there we were building sheaves, binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly, the sh my sheep rose and stood up upright." Then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheep. His brother said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dream and his words. He had another dream and told it to his brother, saying, Look, I have another dream. 
the sun, the moon, and even stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and his brothers, his fathers rebuked him and said to him, what kind of dream is this that you have had? Shall we indeed come? I am your mother. I and your mother am your brothers and bow to the ground before you. Verse 11, so his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. 23 to 24, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. 28, when some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him up out of the pit and sold him to the, to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver and they took Joseph to Egypt. Thank you. <clears throat> now, most of us are familiar with the story of Joseph. We're familiar with Jacob. But I think right now it's appropriate to just go back a little bit as we look at what has unfolded here, and we'll be talking about Joseph and Jacob for the next four Sundays. Mm -hmm. So I don't wanna get ahead, but I think it's also important for us to uh, look back and see who really Joseph is, okay? He's the baby boy. Right of Jacob. And you notice when we got to the second verse or the third verse, the name changed and it says, now Israel loved Joseph. I wanted to point that out because Israel, in fact, name, that is uh, Jacob. The Lord changed Jacob's name to Israel but I thought it was interesting that they showed that right in this passage because they go back to Jacob several times. So I wanted to point that out. So Jacob is the son of Isaac. And Isaac's father was Abraham. So it's important for us to realize as we delve into this fascinating story that God had already promised Abraham that his heirs would be the father of all nations. Not some, but all nations. And that these dreams that Joseph had no matter how dramatic they are, God had conversations with Jacob, with Isaac, and Abraham before Joseph. So this is a familiar trait because they had favor with God. Amen. We need to understand that. But we also understand that this story as we are discussing this morning is about problems that occur with families. Mm. Mm. And if you look on the text, it says, agape love, and below that it says blended families. Yeah. So back in the day, it was okay for polygamy, which is also down there at the bottom. It's a practice where men legally can marry more than one woman. And Jacob had had a difficult time. I encourage you to go back and read about Jacob because Jacob had a twin brother named Esau. And he had cheated Esau out of his inheritance because Esau was the firstborn. And his mother favored him. And Jacob 
favorite joke. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. Isaac. Isaac. So it, there were some issues that had occurred before Joseph came along. And if we read the scripture, Joseph was the baby boy. He was 17 years old. And Jacob went through a lot of problems because he really fell in love with uh, Joseph's mother first, but she couldn't have children. And she had a concubine that had a couple of boys before she was able the Lord was blessed her to have Joseph. So that's why he was favored by Jacob or Jacob. So we need to understand that. So this, this caused some problems. So we're focusing on love, which is an uh, essential attribute of Christian discipleship. Amen. So we begin this lesson with a well-known story of Joseph, which illustrates as it experiences in Jacob's family. Jacob was the grandson of Abraham, and God called to be the ancestor of multiple nations, as I said. And so that's where we are. So life within this family had a divine inheritance which would suggest from a human perspective an environment where love, peace, harmony should prevail. Furthermore, God specifically commanded Jacob and all of Israel to teach their children so that they and future generations would know God and obey his commandments. Now I want somebody to go to Psalms 78, three verses five through eight. Psalms 3, what now? Uh, Psalm 78, chapter 78, Psalm 78, verses 5 and 8. Psalm 78, verse what? I got it. Okay. Psalm 78, verse 5 through 8. 5 and 8. For he issued his laws to Jacob, he gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children, so the next generation might know them even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Verse 8. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. Now, I looked at that, and thanks for reading that, is because we are today critical of the generation that we brought forth. Mm -hmm. But when we look at ourselves, this commandment from God is still relevant <coughs> all the way back to the beginning of his chosen people. And that is, we should teach our children about God and teach them to obey commandments. Amen. So issues within families, issues with us, and all of us have issues, occur because we do not follow the commandment of God who created us. Mm -hmm. I want that to soak in. 
So we get caught up in gossip. We talk about our children's children. We talk about our aunties. We talk about our grandparents and things that are happening. My but Lord. just like the commandments that were given, if they are not followed, the result of disobedience is intergenerational. Amen. And it goes on down. So some of us who wonder why we're in the predicament we're in, mm -hmm. it's because of something that happened before we were even born. Mm. But thanks be to the glory of God Amen. that he allows at any time for those problems to be resolved if we would just consult with him, share our issues, and ask him to intervene. So even Jacob failed to demonstrate unconditional love among his children and to teach them love unconditionally. Why do you think that's so? It's because the woman that he first laid eyes on and he loved was the woman that he wanted to marry, but his uncle tricked them into a 20 years of servitude in order for him to be able to marry <coughs> Rachel, who was Joseph's mother. So issues come about because of how we treat each other. And so we have to focus on what is unconditional love. I want to go back up here and look at agape love. It's a Greco-Christian term used to describe love and charity in their highest form, including God's love for mankind and love to be expressed for God by humankind. Okay? So as a consequence, of Jacob's preferential love for his son, jealousy arose. Jealousy arose. Now, I have a question for everybody. If you had a dream or your child had a dream and that child shared that dream with you. And that dream revealed that that person was going to become a great person that you may have to bow down to at some point. How would you accept an excited child coming to you telling you of that dream? Well, somebody. I mean, I think it would depend, you know, when you say bow down, I think about like Obama and how, you know, um, it would have felt to have been the parent of Obama because in an essence, you would be bowing down. He's the leader of the nation. And I think that would have been pretty cool and awesome. I'd be like, go ahead, boy. Okay. That's from my perspective. That's from Pam's perspective. But that's, that's what happens. But sometimes when children out of their excitement share their dreams and their desires, we want to put them in their place. Much like Joseph brothers did, even the father. And the father had dreams too. He had conversations with God who instructed him. So it wasn't like 
he didn't know because the Lord also told him that his sons will be fathers of kings and of nations. So this was an issue. So Jacob was part of a blended family. He had six or seven brothers. Uh, some of them were from Leah. Some of them were from Cochabons. So in this situation, he was the baby boy. Mm -hmm. His father loved him so much. And he didn't hold it back. The story of Jacob's marriage mm -hmm. to two sisters is well known. That's, that's, that's what I'm talking about. He, he was tricked and he married the oldest sister, but he wanted to marry Rachel, the youngest sister. <laughs> and that's why he had to work so hard. And as a result, Rachel couldn't have children. She had handmaidens. She loved uh, Jacob so much that she wanted to have a child because Leah, who, uh, who Jacob didn't really love as much as he loved Rachel, had a lot of sons, but she couldn't get his attention. He still focused his attention on Rachel. So jealousy had began a whole generation prior to Joseph coming on the scene. Yeah. 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 So, Mr. Go Teacher, I, I just have a question. That little spot in there, which I didn't know when it, so it talks about Leah and Rachel, mm -hmm. but then it also talks that he had 12 sons and one daughter with four women. Right. So they focus on right. two, but he had two other women. Yeah, right. that's because My was Rolling Stone up in there. No, Leah had time. four or five yeah. sons, and then she yeah. couldn't have any more. So right. then he offered her Cocobon to yeah. have some more children from him. So that's where all these children yeah. come from. Yeah. 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 So it's and realized, the <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and then Rachel couldn't bear. So she had her Cocobon to have children for him. So it was a whole lot of stuff going on. Yes. And in a polygamous relationship, women are adjusting for position for the husband to sleep with, right. with the, the woman he favor. They favor. So they're I'm all right. trying to get him to sleep with. Mm. So is that where people pull this whole thing? It's okay to have a polygamy marriage. I mean, because I know some cultures do, and you know, you see yeah. the shows on TV, and we frown upon it, but this is what they were doing back in the day. And, and biblically, uh, you're right, Pam. It's, it's in the Bible. I'm sure they use that as a uh, reference as to um, uh, make the case known. And also, I, I was reading this earlier, thinking that. Uh, for the African American families, uh, you know, we have um, brothers and sisters with multiple children, multiple families, and all of that. And I'm sure, in some crazy way, that, that we too looked at this as a model that it was okay. It's in the Bible, so um, it's okay to have multiple children for multiple women and families and things. But for me, um, that term blended family. Uh, you know, we, we're all familiar with that, but it also um, it enriches, it validates uh, our family's uh, situation now in that the, the uh, lesson says over more than 50% of families in the United States, including children or from previous relationships and marriages, of uh, one or both parents. So I think over the years, we've seen blended families come into the spotlight. I think it's always has been, but now it's more in the spotlight and it's it's okay in a sense. Um, am I making myself clear? Yeah. yeah. You, cannot go, you can't go anywhere without a, a blended family. It's just a part where before people would uh, hide out in the back, wouldn't acknowledge their family, their, uh, their aunt, their mom, their dad, whomever wouldn't acknowledge certain children. But now um, it's a part of, of life. And... Um, because of the era we live in, people are embracing blended families. 
And then we, and Brother Pride, when you look over to at uh, the Sankofa, I, I thought about this, for so many years, generations, we were uh, unable to marry, you know, legally marry. We were separated from families and children were separated from parents and all of that, sisters and brothers. And so for African-Americans, uh, I thought about this this morning, it's kind of like, so that's why we love gathering. No matter whether it's on the shade tree or in the front yard or the backyard, you find uh, African Americans always gathering in large numbers because I believe it's in, innate that we was uh, so um, we, were un- we were not allowed to to gather during the during the slavery days that now uh, people just love to gather and, and, and blended families come together and celebrate. Amen. Amen. We're coming to that. We're coming to that. Yeah. I also want to remind you that back then, wealth was based on how Mm -hmm. much cattle and animals you own. Right. 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 And the land that you own. And those were basically handed down to the children, to the male children. Correct. In order to keep the family wealthy. Right. So they wanted to have as many boys as they could. So Jacob was considered a wealthy man, but his father was wealthy. Because <laughs> he owned a lot of cattle. Camels. Sheep. And so he was wealthy. And so then they would go out and hire other people to help shepherd those animals. And then they would be part or become master over those persons who work for them. You see? Mm -hmm. Now, in our text, it lifts up parental favoritism produces jealousy and hate. So it's important to note that Jacob's biological family mm-hmm. practice of parental favoritism was intergenerational. His parents, Isaac and Rebecca, showed favoritism between Jacob and his right. twin brother Esau. Isaac chose Esau and Rebecca chose Jacob. Consequently, for many years, relations between Jacob and Esau were fraught with extreme jealousy and hate. <laughs> Matter of fact, they spent a great deal of their younger part of their lives, over 20 or 30 years, Esau pursuing him, Jacob, and Jacob hiding from his brother because he felt that he was going to be murdered because he stole his birthright. So uh, today's scripture begins with scenes suggestive of a peaceful pastoral setting interaction between Jacob's sons, how it quickly changes the original perception as Joseph is working with his brothers as a sheep herder. The other thing is, we can see the brothers looked upon Joseph with disfavor. They disfavor, the disfavor gradually unfolds. And in addition to the father's favoritism, the brothers also disliked Joseph because he tattled on him. So, you know, he would send his young son, Joseph, out to see what the older brothers were doing when they were attending to the sheep and the cattle. And Joseph would come back and tell his father. And so the brothers didn't like him. They used a strong word here. They said they hated him. Well, I guess you could say they hated him because of what happened. And they could not speak peacefully of him. And his father had a special coat made for Jacob. Jacob had a special coat made for Joseph, which uh, provoked the older brothers to anger and destructiveness. Mm -hmm. And so this jealousy and hate led to violence and destructiveness. So what happened was that when his father sent him to to go uh, help his brothers out, they saw him coming along, 
And they said, well, you know, we're going to use this opportunity while father is not mm -hmm. alone mm -hmm. to get rid of Joseph. Mm -hmm. So they plotted to kill him. Right. Uh, Joseph was sent by his father to a place where they were supposed to be tending to the animals, but they had right. moved along and he ran into a stranger. Mm. And the stranger told him that they had moved on to Dothan. And Dothan was another area, so he came up to him. But when they saw him a half a mile or so ahead, they dug a pit. Mm -hmm. And they decided to throw him in there, and they were going to kill him. But one of their brothers persuaded the other brothers not to kill him, but just leave him there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a caravan of uh, traders came along. And they decided that they would sell them off. Mm -hmm. And they were headed to where? Egypt. Egypt. And this is where the story is going to unfold a little later. Mm -hmm. They stripped his fancy coat off of him. My, my, my. Killed mm. an animal. Smeared the blood yeah. on the coat and had one of the workers to take it to his father. And his father obviously was grief stricken. You can imagine. Yes. If you sent your baby boy out mm. to meet up with his big brothers and they come back in his coat full of blood. Mm. So his father spent years thinking that Joseph had been Injured, maimed, eaten alive by some wild animal and left mm -hmm. for dead. <clears throat> so the other part of that is deceit, murder, or the uh, the the yeah. thought of murder mm -hmm. were sins that were committed. Can you imagine? having a plot where you have a brother or sister captured and sold off mm -hmm. into slavery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's what happened. Mm -hmm. So we see nothing has changed. Right. That violence, destructive behavior, hate, hatred of one another mm -hmm. leads to what? Sin. Violence. Violence. Sin. 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 Violence. Generational, too. Generational. And it keeps multiplying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cover up. But it also we'll learn to, to come that God is a forgiven God. He punishes us in, in ways that we don't quite understand. And it takes time to overcome these things. But the Lord also is urging us through his actions to turn to him mm -hmm when we have trouble. Now, obviously, there are some of us, most of us have issues that we have buried deep in our mind. That we don't like to talk about it. We don't want to deal with it. It could have happened with a brother, a sister, a cousin, uncle. Mm -hmm. And we must reconcile. <clears throat> Learn what forgiveness is. Mm -hmm. Here's what our pastor was talking about in the text. It, this is interesting because 
He read ahead the Sankofa mm-hmm. moment. Mm-hmm. I made a little note here. It's from the Twi, twi language Which, from Ghana. Um, right. You know, indeed, some of our ancestors are from there. But what it really means is that as we move forward, because the, the, the symbol for Sankofa is a bird. Right. Put an egg in his mouth. Yes, yeah, so you're teaching. With his feet, <laughs> feet going forward, but his That's head it. turned back toward his tail, grasping right. that egg. Yeah. And it suggests right. that we must always look back and learn the lessons From the past. of the past right. so that we don't repeat them in the future. And it helps us to guide our steps to take the good things from the past. That's it. That's it. As we move forward. That's it. Okay. And, and uh, Dr. Pryor, also with that, with the um, Sankofa moments in our lives, in, in short, we always say, go back and get it. Go get the good stuff and remember the things, the bad things, so that, like you say, that you don't repeat it but also to pass that on to uh, generations, to all of our children, nieces, nephews, and to pass them. It's a rich uh, African tradition, meaning that we need to embrace. And um, when, in, this, in my language, when, when our colleagues in ministry, our brothers and sisters, Maria and I call my cousins, when they uh, talk about what countries they are from and that their lineage. We need to talk about some of our traditions and let them know part of our tradition, that we have a, a tradition called Sankofa, which means to go back and get it and be proud of that and teach your, your son, uh, Fry and Pam, teach your son what Sankofa means and, and uh, teach your nieces and nephews and cousins what it means to embrace those African traditions because the larger, uh, sometimes dominant culture will try and minimize, if not uh, eliminate our culture. It's up to us to keep that going through oral tradition. Amen? Amen. Right. Matter of fact, last week I was listening, I went back uh, and found some 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 African cultures that still exist. And they're back basically still their culture hasn't changed in a couple of thousand years. So traditionally in Africa, when a boy becomes of age, he has to go through some rituals right. to demonstrate his bravery, his trustworthiness. <clears throat> and uh, his respect for his ancestors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after he goes through that ritual, then the chief and his parents and the potential bride that he might have Mm -hmm. establish a diary Mm -hmm. before he could get married. So that's one of the traditions that lost with our being sold into slavery. That's good. That's right. Is that our parents had a big influence on who we would marry. Mm -hmm. And we would have to prove, men would have to prove that they are worthy Mm -hmm. and that they couldn't take care of their children. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so, what destroyed that? Well, when we were sold over to slavery here, mm-hmm. the institutions of slavery didn't want your culture to survive the way it did over there because they were afraid you may rise up. Mm. and fight back so that they would keep brothers and sisters separated, parents 
separated. And when they move them to a different plantation, then they would force them to mate with another person in mm -hmm. order to produce more offspring. Mm -hmm. And so the system for slaves, it was against the law for them to actually have marriages. Right, that's horrible. So when you think about it, it makes you angry. But one has to say, wow, we are turned out pretty good when we look at the fact that we're on Zoom mm -hmm. talking about Sunday school this morning. Mm -hmm. And 200 or less than 200 years ago, mm -hmm. this was going on. Right. And Prop, the other thing, yeah, it's easy to become angry. And as I was reading the other day, it's easy to become angry. But what we have to do those of us who are on this call, we have to take this knowledge and not uh, hoard it to ourselves, but share it with our brothers, our sisters at church, our, our biological brothers and sisters, our nieces, nephews, cousins, children. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm be, I want to be specific. Like, for example, those of you all who have children and um, and sometimes, uh, I'm saying my nieces, they may minimize um, our spirituality. They may, they may minimize uh, the relationship that we have uh, with God or with our church. But that's a part of the rich African tradition that needs to be passed on. And there's no sense in them going out into the world seeking um, some other tradition when they have a rich tradition that they need to grasp hold of. Am I making myself clear? Yes. And uh, it's, it's just so important because we're, in a, we're living in a world now where, you know, well, uh, oh, that's mama's religion. Oh, that's, that's, that's mama. Oh, that's old. That's a historic Mount Zion. You know, they the old folks and all of that. But no, this is a rich tradition that they need to some kind, somehow find a way to be a part of that legacy and to reconnect. Amen. And yeah. especially, especially in the era that we're living in now, in this blended society and Black Lives Matter, um, for so many, so we're, right before our eyes, we're reading how uh, the Europeans uh, hid our culture, hid and destroyed uh, our culture, the indigenous people's culture. So, but we now know what will happen. So we have to grasp hold of this and teach it to our children, to our nieces and nephews, say you are from a rich nation. You're from a rich heritage and to, and to be proud of that and walk with your head up in that. Amen? Amen. 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 I want us to focus on the case study, those who can see the screen. Yes. And uh, one of our beloved uh, black history persons, Frederick Douglass, one of our brothers, he mm -hmm. was a renowned orator, writer, abolitionist, and statement is an example of the kind of resiliency preserved that has propelled African Americans to exclaim, uh, to claim and exhibit God-given rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Douglas was born into slavery around 1817. He was separated from his mother as an infant. He came to to know her through infrequent visits when she could slip away from her owner's plantation to visit him at night. Mm -hmm. Douglas never knew his father, who was believed to have owned his mother as a slave. Mm -hmm. In his autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, Douglas gave detailed graphic accounts of his life as a slave. Mm -hmm. Childhood, as slaves knew it, ended for Douglas at the age of six mm -hmm. when he was taken from his grandmother and other family members. He was forced to live and work in his owner's home. Severe beatings and oppressive inhumane treatments pervaded his life until he escaped from slavery to freedom around 1838. Memories of his mother are sad commentaries of slavery's toll on Frederick's life. Mm -hmm. His mother died 
when I was about seven years old. I was not allowed to be present during her illness, at her death, or burial. Recalling how little contact he'd been allowed to have with his mother, Douglas said he received the tidings of her death with as much the same emotions as I should have probably felt at the death of a stranger. Mm. Despite the pain and suffering of his early life, Douglas developed a love for God and determined to serve his oppressed brothers and sisters, that's us. Mm -hmm. Douglas attributed his aspiration for life beyond and without slavery, as well as his faith that would propel him forward in spite of struggles. Good God. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you know, he became an ambassador to Haiti. Right. He was an advisor to President Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Great man. So what are the life applications? Let's examine this. Children are socialized and, person and personal identities are developed in the home. Mm -hmm. As lessons on love, as positive and negative, mm -hmm. are taught, like Jacob's family, through the blood of Jesus Christ, we're also heirs to a divine destiny. Mm -hmm. Failure to teach and practice agape love in our homes would not only infect the immediate family with major dysfunction, it can also spread to the church and other relationships beyond. Yes, yes, Lord. Amen. That's so true. So think about that when you see mm -hmm. us acting up when we're in the presence of one another. My, my, my. The cure for acting up, the cure for dysfunction is what? Love. Love. Love them despite the way they act. Right. But also share with them that God <laughs> can help with any problem. Mm -hmm. And we get them involved in Sunday school and in mm -hmm. church. We learn mm -hmm. the stories that we're learning today. Mm -hmm. And even though we hear them over and over, each time we hear them, our soul learn something new, mm -hmm. right? Which helps Amen. us to grow. Amen. Or you keep going in and out. Right? Amen. So Jacob's family story is rife with examples of dysfunction. Agape love could never thrive in this environment. <laughs> hmm. And I can tell you, I was talking with some friends on the golf course, and you know, even today in some cultures, even some of the cultures who come over here and think they're better, you still have a lot of dysfunctional families in the Caribbean. <laughs> and I, yeah. I, you know, because of uh, some of these same issues. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The family's relationships were primarily characterized by unresolved conflicts that fostered extreme anger, envy, jealousy, and hatred. Parental favoritism, civil rivalry, and such feelings of estrangement were supporting frameworks for this dysfunction to emerge and continue. Yes. Now, I'm going to skip down to the questions. Can you see the questions? Mm -hmm. First question is, what experiences do you have with parental favoritism? Mm. Mm. Can I, I want to make one comment before we get to that. Okay. As I was, as, as I was reading the lesson, I thought of, I was saddened by what I read about uh, Frederick Douglass's life, about his mother's passing. Mm -hmm. And I could hear um, some of my professors saying things like, uh, and because of that history as an African-American, maybe could it be that that's why when somebody dies in the family that we 
uh, takes. Back in the day, we would take two two weeks, a stretch of two or three weeks to bury someone. So everybody in the family could come to the funeral because there was a time uh, we were not allowed to go to funerals because of doing the slavery. So now that we are free, and I'm, you know, I'm speaking maybe say 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, everybody and their mama came to Big Mama's funeral. And they would keep the body you know, in, 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 at the mortuary for weeks so that everybody could come. And I'm looking at that differently now in that that's a tradition. That's a tradition of the African-American family. And we need, I used to minimize and laugh and joke about it. But when you, when you, when you look at it in the context of thinking about Frederick Douglass, I can understand why. Uh, my grandparents and my great-grandparents and my aunts and uncles, why we did that because there was a time that we were not allowed to go to funerals. So I, I like, when I read that, it just kind of enriched one of our own tradition that we minimize now. Okay, I want to, that's the first thing I want to, what I said, I want to kind of bring that out. Um, any comments on that from anyone? I have a comment. Well, and one of the comments is that a lot of relatives move to different places. They move right. to the North, right. They moved right. to the Midwest, right. and so they needed time to travel. And right. back in the day, they needed time to communicate that somebody right. had passed, That's which means that they had to get off from work, they right. had to travel, they had to get there. But a mm -hmm. more important question, Pastor, is mm -hmm. today is September 6th. How many families actually take the time and have the desire to come to someone who's lost, who's passed? Where does our family strength reside? Yeah. Yeah. Now, as you described, we kept close contacts with first, second, third cousins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And their children and, our, and, and, and uncles and aunts. Mm -hmm. But the average American in this culture today, if you're under 30 years old, you're going to move more than 12 times in your lifetime. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. It's already happening. We have right. members who are at our church who move four or five times in one year. Right. And when you think about the impact of the, vi the virus is having, mm -hmm. there we're going to be witnessing people who are displaced, who mm -hmm. may become homeless, mm -hmm. who uh, move and you won't know where they are. Right. Mm -hmm. And they have children and the children become estranged from their grandparents, their yes. aunts and their uncles. Yes. But think about the folk who live right in the same city in the same town who don't really know their cousins and their uncles and their aunts mm -hmm. and their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. What impact does that have on rituals like funerals? Good morning. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and good morning, everyone. You know, listening to the lesson in the background. <clears throat> and we're saying, you know, the disconnect with our young people. But even back in biblical times, it started in the family with the parents. And mm -hmm. they started that. They started that relationship of the jealousy and the backbiting. And, you know, our children emulate what they see. That's right. That's right. And when they see it coming from the people in authority that they love, then mm -hmm. this becomes their norm. Yes. So that's why I pointed out earlier mm -hmm. what God had told Jacob. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Make Amen. sure that you teach your children and mm -hmm. their children about what thus the Lord says. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Keep about him, his goodness and his love, so that it's passed down. And the church has traditionally been a place that we were forced to go to so that we would have that. Mm -hmm. But the generations now don't necessarily force their kids to go somewhere they don't want to be. Right. And they're no, missing. But they don't come. And, so. and they don't come because of pain of experiences and not understanding the nature of God. Right. I've heard so many people ask this question. How can God let this happen? Well, the question really should be, how did we let this happen? You let it happen. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because God has made known what he wants. Right. Reconciliation. And we have free choice. And part of reconciliation, yeah. part of reconciliation is at some point having an open conversation with someone who has hurt you, uh, families, aunts and cousins and nieces and nephews, and sometimes relatives can hurt one another. And at some point, you have to have a conversation with them and say, you know, I love you, but you hurt me this way and let it be known. And if, you, if they uh, ask for forgiveness, and you know, y'all pray about it, you want a brother or sister, if not, you shake the dust off your feet. But you want to eventually have to come together and to reconcile and say, you know, you you hurt me in this way, and um, so many years ago, and that, but now I'm in. You know, I just think a conversation needs to be held. Oh yeah. Of recon reconciliation and love in in every family. That somebody, all of our family, someone has hurt us. I've gotten mad. I was mad at different people about different things, but eventually I had to go to them and say, listen, I was disappointed in you when this happened. Yeah. You know, say, oh, I didn't know I hurt you. Because most of the time they say hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes people do things, they don't know what they're doing. So anybody had an experience with that? Oh, yeah. Uh, I was trying to keep us on this first question. Okay, that was part, that's part of it too. We can, that's we can part answer. of it too. But uh, for an example, uh, I've had more than one marriage. And I have children, but I've made a very strong point to try to keep those children united That's good. wherever I go and That's to good. let them know they have brothers and sisters and that they should love one another. But also, it depends on when the child interacts with the other children, what they see. Mm -hmm. Some children might feel that when they come to visit, they the other child is hugged up under them. I had that experience. One of my daughters just loved to cling to me. And I found out a few weeks later that the other child was jealous. Mm. And I say, well, there's a left and a right side. The next time, just come snugger right up under the other side. <laughs> <laughs> made, made her feel better. But right. then, as a parent, I didn't think about that. Right. But... I didn't repel the other child because they were used to being up under me. Mm -hmm. The visiting sibling felt, um, I don't know if I have a space, a spot under there. So you have to make it clear. Right. Getting back to the parents set the tone. Yes. Now, the other part of that sometimes, and I don't mean step on any toes, but when these separations and marriages occur, people get alienated from one parent because the one parent is trying to get back at another parent. Mm -hmm. So they try to keep one child away from one parent. I'm not going to let you visit over there because of whatever happened in our relationship. That also mm -hmm. scars children. It does. Mm -hmm. And Next so question. church and church school and church mm -hmm. interactions help because we always encounter people, regardless of our family situation, who's able to openly embrace us and show us love mm -hmm. in the church. Mm -hmm. And who takes the time to call you and see how you're doing. Mm -hmm. Right? And we need more of that love. 
for some of these children who find themselves in a situation where they don't know where to turn to the left, to the right, the front, or the back. Mm -hmm. What, when kids are acting out and when they get in trouble, it is a sign that they're struggling. That's true. They're struggling because of a lack of love. So be aware of it. Don't be in such a hurry that you can't take a few minutes to stoop down at a child's level, ask them how they're doing, give them a hug, encourage them. Mm -hmm. Because there are some folk out there, some children out there, some young people out there that just have greatness written all over them. All they need is just a little push, a little encouragement so that they can have faith in humanity. And they're, they're, they're hungry to know more about the goodness of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And we have to fill in the blank just like the slaves did my, my. when a parent was murdered by a slave master. What do you think happened to those kids? Trauma. Like Frederick Douglass. Trauma, yes, sir. And you see how he emerged simply because somebody paid attention and gave him some lessons on how to read. Mm -hmm. A hug, a meal, and he became a great person. Well, Lamoris, that didn't just happen back then. You know, when you look at these um, extended family mm -hmm. or these these children who are raised by, you know, my experience, being uh -huh. raised by someone that is not a blood relative, but they saw a need. Exactly. And, and you know, our society is being set up where it's hindering that and our children are left in foster care and they are suffering. And just a, a parent that you see that is um, not doing the things that they should be doing for the life of their child and somebody reaches out. And yes, we would like for it to be a brother or a sister or aunt or an uncle, but it might be the neighbor next door, or it might be um, someone at school who sees something happening. And, you know, but when we see a need, we need to address the need and, and help our children. Um, and, it, and it goes further than the bloodline. Bloodline is great. I'm not taking anything from it. But Amen. you know, I wasn't raised by my um, biological parents. Um, I was raised by uh, an uncle and an aunt, um, married aunt. And um, those were my parents. And right. then I raised a child that was a God child's child. You know, and those things go on. It's not, it's not uncommon that mm -hmm. we are raising someone else's children or taking care of someone else because mm -hmm. that's what we should do. That's what Frederick, the people in Frederick Douglass's <laughs> life did. He was six years old. He didn't raise himself. There was someone there who guided him. And when things didn't go like they should in my life, someone else stood, stepped in or we stood and we stand in the gap. And so many times you hear people saying, I don't want to get involved. But it's not about not getting involved. It's about, about reaching out and pulling somebody else up. Thank Amen. you for that. Well said. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Well said. That's why it's so important for us to remember this, this lesson and uh, not be rooted in uh, tradition all the time. But make sure we're rooted. Tradition is fine. Just like you say, you know, we have the, yeah. uh, the regular families and stuff like that. But make sure we're rooted in love. Let right. love take precedence over to the tradition. Yes. Right. Amen. I like, I like that. And I want to add to that, uh, Brother Roosevelt. Um, let love take precedence over tradition. But in tradition, there is love. Amen. Tra yeah. Amen. Tradition, the tradition Amen. family of God is love. Amen. So even with even with blended families, um, <clears throat> extended family, whatever term we want to use, if love is at the center, yeah, all hallelujah, 
the, 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 the nieces, the nephews, you know, raise a niece like a daughter, raise a nephew like a son. It doesn't matter. And I, I, I've had experience like uh, Sister Gloria mentioned, not as a child, but from a, from a, uh, a chaplain's perspective, I've met um, men and women who are taking care of someone in, the, in, a, in a hospital situation. And I'm thinking the entire time, this is their son or daughter. And it's a social worker that reminds me, said, no, Chaplain Cole, that's, um, that's, uh, that was their mom's neighbors who mm -hmm. took care of her. Amen. That was the God child from California. Mm -hmm. She moved to Florida for six months to take care of, you know, this person. So, and I always said, um, you know, it doesn't matter that if, when you love the Lord, God will put someone in place. It yes. doesn't matter whether you have children or not, whether you have grandchildren, nieces and nephews. God says, I'm not going to leave you nor forsake you. God, somebody will step in yes. and, and be there for whomever in your time of need. As Daddy Cole used to say, somebody will be there to bring you your pajamas and a glass of water when you need it, when you're old That's and feeble. Amen. 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 I've seen that. I have literally have seen that. And they are so dedicated to the very end. And then hours before the death, someone flies in from some place and they'll, they'll nod and say, that's the daughter right there. I go like, oh, oh, okay. They come, at least they show up, but it's been, it's been the niece or the nephew or the godchild that's been there for months or years taking care oh, of yeah. that person. Yeah. So God has a way. Amen. And it's in and his plan. love, ma'am. It's in his plan. It's in his you know, and, and that's the love that Roosevelt was talking about. That's part of the tradition, not taking away anything right. from what you said, but part of our tradition, part of, for me, part of the African American tradition, Black family tradition is love. We gather love. as family and friends. That's why when, when my mom died, my grandmother <clears> died back in the day, we gather all the time. I said, just because they're dead and gone, we should not, we should not uh, stop. We should continue to gather. So we made a conscious effort many years ago, to always gather as, as family. I don't care if it's 10, 2, 1, we gather, you know, on a regular yeah. basis to keep up, quote unquote, that tradition. Because if you don't, you know, we're trying to teach the, the, the young'uns, as we say, mm -hmm. this is what we're all about. You know, when I get to be 90, 95, don't push me in a corner, you know, bring me around the table. Amen. <laughs> push me in front of my face and let's eat. So anyway, but that's part of our tradition. So I want one other comment I want to make about that question number one. What experiences do you have with uh, parental favoritism? And I, when I read it over and over again, I thought about an answer my father gave me many years ago. He said his uncle Carl told him, he said, Calvin, you're gonna, you have five children and there's gonna be a tendency to favor one child over the next. He said, but what you wanna do, each child has his or her own ability. Each child has her own uh, gifts from God. And you, as, you, as your children grow older, you <clears throat> learn uh, who to trust what with. And no child, you know, you, will, you, will, you will won't want to favor any one child, but each child has his own area of expertise. And that's kind of how I think my father dealt with all of us in that area. And so I can say I did not grow up with favoritism, but we each you know, uh, was favored in, in, in their eyes in certain areas, you know? I have uh, 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 something I don't always share with folks, but uh, my brothers and sisters used to tease me that they thought that I was the favorite. Okay. And I remember when, my, when Roosevelt was born, <laughs> I asked my mother about that. And she said, oh, honey, I try to treat y'all the same, but, but you weren't the first child. You had a stillborn sister. Yeah. And so when you came along, mm -hmm. we spent a lot of time over you. But then, you know, she had children right. Uh, my brother and my sister the next year. So I didn't quite un understand that. But, mm -hmm. but I guess they were uh, very protective of that fact. So sometimes things out of your control. And then when I explain that to them, it sort of changed that dynamic. But also being the oldest, you're challenged by your siblings all the time, you know, because right. you're left in charge of them and they go away and they come back, they're 
any of them act up, you got punished for it. Mm -hmm. so, so that that was somewhat of my experience. So uh, what advice would you give others who struggle because of parental favoritism? Mm -hmm. Be authentically who you are. Don't try to be anybody else. Just be who you are, who God made you to be. And, um, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was shaking my head when uh, my brother just made that comment, and I was doing it um, jokingly, really. But I have to say that moms really did a good job as far as, you know, we knew that, he was the oldest, and, uh, and one time I did ask her, and she, she explained to me what happened as far as with the, her first child being stillborn, and she was just so uh, glad that, that Lamar was, came here and was, you know, stayed here that, you know, she, you know, she was proud of him. And so from that point on, I understood that, you know what I mean? But like I said, there was never really no real favoritism. We jokingly always said that. But I also <laughs> have to... Uh, Go back to like with tradition, my father and mother, they had two sons before me. But mm -hmm. traditionally, Morris would have been named after my father. But they reserved that for some reason or another, and they named he named me after him. So I have to wonder what kind of effect sometimes did that have on them, you know. Hmm. But you but you know, like I said. Both of them, they did such a wonderful job. I, you know, uh, I have to brag and I have to make that known that yeah. it really didn't cause no issues. Right. You know, Roosevelt um, and Lamores, you know, being the oldest, you can look back at the other siblings, but being the youngest, um, you know, your parents are older and yes. they're more lenient. And then the oldest will think, well, you know, you love the younger one more. Right. And the, the youngest one said, well, you know, um, you get to spend more time with our, our parents, so um, they must love you more. So, you know, we all look at it because we all want more of that attention from, from our parents, you know, looking at it and, you know, in that respect. But um, we might look at it as seeing that it's favoritism. And I think, oops. <clears throat> Okay, we might look at it and see it as favoritism, but, you know, um, I think it's the way we, um, each of us have our own special characteristics right, and gifts and ability, and mm -hmm. our parents play to those um, characteristics, and it's the way we perceive it, and they're looking at each child, and one child may need more of one thing than another. That's what, that's it, Lori, that's yeah. it. Yeah, I'm looking at Brother Calhoun over there. I know he has something to say because he's full of the life experience. Get up, <laughs> man, huh? you give us some of your wisdom and pearls, brother. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, good brother, I am in a travel status and I'm not able to talk because it's going to be disturbing to folk who I'm in here with. So okay. if y'all will forgive me this time, but I am enjoying this robust dialogue. But if you would forgive me, I need to be on mute. Okay, gotcha. Amen, amen. Okay. Brother Calvin, I heard your voice earlier. Hmm? Yeah. Williams. Mm -hmm. You might be off. Mm. All right, and how do you demonstrate love toward others in your home, the church, and beyond? Oh, where are we? Question what now? How do we demonstrate love toward others in our home, the church, and beyond? I mean, I think if you just treat others the way you want to be treated, that's you biblical. demonstrate that's love. Right. Yeah, that's biblical, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Do unto others as you have them do unto you. Amen. All right. Um, in closing, I want to throw this out. Pam just got through talking. We just celebrated our 28th wedding anniversary yesterday. Uh, congratulations. We're, we're congratulations. After we 
get off of here to go up to uh we won't go <laughs> we back. already have fancy right. pastor i want to go where y'all at y'all look like y'all <laughs> <laughs> but I think the closing devotion is so great. Let's look at this. Lord, we thank you for loving us, choosing us, and commissioning us to be your ambassadors. Your word tell us to let our light shine before others so that they may see our good works and give glory to you in heaven. We pray, Father, that love will be the fuel that powers our lights mm -hmm. and that we will never forget the importance of shining our lights at home before attempting to light the way for <laughs> the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Good lesson. Thank you, sir. Any announcements, Sister Kanitha? Sister Kanitha. Can you hear me? We have yes, no announcement. Sorry. Right. We have no announcement. <laughs> no announcement. Okay, no problem. When is quarterly, right, Reverend? Quarterly is the ninth. So you may want to remind on that. Well, in conference. Is it the ninth? Just give me the. That's Wednesday. It's this Wednesday. Okay. And I'll send out the Zoom. Yeah, we'll send out the Zoom link uh, on yeah, Monday, oh, Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah, we'll set up the Zoom link. Other than that, uh, Bible study uh, at 10 a.m. on Wednesday. And Wednesday, this week we may not have um, Wednesday in the Word because of quarterly conference. Any celebrations, any uh, prayer concerns from the, uh, those who are present? No prayer concerns, no celebrations. Well, one word of caution. Yes, sir. Is don't let your guard down during this holiday period tomorrow and this long weekend. Yes, sir. Make sure you wear your protective mask if you go out. And don't be lured into being in the large crowds. My, my, my. Right? And may mm, God amen. Thank you for that. Amen. And protect you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that. Thank you for that wonderful lesson. Thank you all for attending uh, Bible Discovery Hour. I see where your mask, like Pam and Brother Roosevelt. Then you get a moment. Would you close out in a word of prayer, sir? Oh, yeah. That's it. Okay. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful, Heavenly Father, for this wonderful message of, of love, Heavenly Father, and spreading love throughout our life, throughout our family, Heavenly Father. We thank you for the, yeah. allowing us to get on this platform once again. We thank you for mm -hmm. the teaching. We thank you for the participants, participants, Heavenly Father. And we, and we don't want to close out, Heavenly Father, without asking Heavenly Father that we continue to give us eyes that see, ears yeah. that hear, and yeah. a discerning heart that understands. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Good seeing you, everybody. Take care. Right. And may the Lord be with you. Right. And also you. with you. And also with you. Also Amen. 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 Amen.